Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, a look at vaccine mandates and individual choice with former ethics professor Julie Panessi. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Welcome to The Andrew Lawton Show. This is Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. We're going to do things a little bit differently on this show. We've been talking for months and months about the increasing rigidness and restrictiveness of vaccine mandates. We're going to today spotlight a woman who you are probably very familiar with by now. She shot to fame just a few months ago when speaking up about her unwillingness to comply with a vaccine mandate being imposed upon her by Huron University College, the affiliated college of Western University in London, Ontario. And that's where she was teaching for years as an ethics professor specializing in medical ethics, which is why she has had a particularly astute opposition to vaccine mandates, which she tried to convey to her school's administration, who subsequently ignored everything she had to say. She launched a video which went viral in which she explained why she was taking the stand that she was. Take a look at a snippet of that. My employer has just mandated that I must get a vaccine for COVID-19. If I want to keep working at my job as a professor, I have to take this vaccine. Here's my conundrum. My school employs me to be an authority on the subject of ethics. I hold a PhD in ethics and ancient philosophy. And I'm here to tell you it's ethically wrong to coerce someone to take a vaccine. If it happens to you, you don't have to do it. If you don't want a COVID vaccine, don't take one. End of discussion. That was Professor Julie Panessi, now terminated from her job because of an unwillingness to go along with a vaccine mandate. She's explained a lot of her decision-making, what she tried to do, and what she thinks about all the things that have happened since then in a new book, My Choice, The Ethical Case Against COVID-19 Vaccine Mandates. That book just published this week at mychoicebook.ca. Professor Julie Panessi joins me now. Professor, thanks very much for coming on today. It's good to speak to you. Of course. Hi, Andrew. So I want to go back to the very basics here, because one of the things that you've seen in the time since you went viral with that initial video and and you address it point blank in the book is that you get caught up in this anti-vaxxer narrative when all that I've ever seen from you and indeed all that is in the book is not about opposition to vaccines, but opposition to vaccine mandates. Yet this conflation of the two, I'd say, has become one of the biggest problems in the discourse surrounding, I mean, not only your case, but the mandates themselves. This is such a complicated issue, and I don't even really know where to start with it. I mean, the term anti-vaxxer, I think, should become extinct immediately, Um, if if for no other reason than because it's slang. It's not a grammatically, uh, you know, well-constructed term. And so to take a slang term like that and apply it to anyone is automatically derogatory, right? And automatically signals that you don't value the person that you're attaching that label to. So that's like one issue right off the bat, right? If you want to uh, lump people together who have criticisms of this set of vaccines or all vaccines, then at least come up with a more respectful term, right? That's my, that's my first point. Um, secondly, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I don't know if I've made this clear or clear enough in, in the book or in previous interviews or appearances, but um, I, I, am, I am pro-choice on this issue. I think people, you know, in Canada, we have a long... Uh, history of developing ethical policies and and juris and jurisprudence to support informed choice, but. The key is that that choice has to be informed. And I can't tell you the number of people I talk to, very bright people still today, people who consider themselves informed because they read you know, mainstream media and they say, uh, what are you talking about? There are no problems with these vaccines and they're a panacea. They will end this pandemic and I am slowing it down, right? And I think that's a reflection of the fact that they think these COVID vaccines are what we call sterilizing, which they're not, right? And so there's a lot of, um, and I really hate to use this term, misinformation. I think there's a lot of confusion over the scientific facts and that's giving rise to, um, 
a mislabeling of people, and there's a lot of harm coming from that. There have been a number of professors, I'd say very few <laughs> compared to uh, what they should be doing, but a number of professors who have spoken out against these vaccine mandates at, at universities. But what's interesting in your case is that your expertise is specifically tied to the idea of vaccine mandates with a background in ethics and, and specifically medical ethics. It depends who you ask, Andrew. <laughs> Pardon me? It depends who you ask. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. But but let's take you at your word and your resume at its word for the time being here. And and you've actually pointed out that the university that you worked for, Huron, part of Western University in London, had paid you to be an ethicist, had paid you to engage in the very discussions that led you to take the stand that you did. And it's amazing how that scholarship they expect from you ends when they're trying to impose this mandate and the government is trying to impose this mandate. I think you I think you have framed that explanation very well. There's a kind there's a kind of irony there uh, and possibly a sort of hypocrisy. Uh, I'm going to correct you for a minute and say I, I don't think you know in hindsight, I don't think they were paying me to uh, be critically reflective and to follow my own reasoning to its logical conclusions. I think they were paying me and every other instructor they hire to follow a certain narrative. And it's become very clear to me being outside of academia now in general, not just at Huron, but in general looking in, that you can think anything you want. You can write anything you want. You can say anything you want, as long as it's within a very narrow spec uh, slice of a broader spectrum, right? Um, you cannot question, for example, the pro-choice movement when it comes to abortion. You cannot question um, certain gender issues at universities these days, and you cannot question the vaccine mandates. These are things that will get you canceled and fired. So if we wanna say that our universities are, you know, um, um, sort of pinnacles of critical thinking, well, we have to reinterpret, in my view, what we mean by that. And what we mean by that is you can think freely within a certain prescribed um, range of, of opinions and beliefs. One thing that I, I find quite interesting is that for a lot of folks, certainly in Canada, the vaccine mandate, the discussion of, of mandatory vaccination at a population level that we're seeing in, in places like Austria and the Czech Republic and Greece, these blindsided a lot of people. And, and they, they have left a lot of people wondering, how did this come about in, you know, my precious Canada, my precious Austria, whatever the case may be. You're very unique in the sense that you saw this mandate coming from a mile away, even before vaccination was being spread out. Explain that to me, because a lot of people did not think it would get where it is where it has gotten you know i'm uh well known i think now in certain circles for saying the following thing which is that whoever i speak with these days about human nature i am always the most pessimistic in the pair uh, and often the person on the other side will say no no i think you're just realistic not pessimistic um i i think it would be fair to say that where we've gotten and I think where we're going to be, and I don't, I don't really mean to scare anyone, but I think we're looking at a Canada in the next few months where employment mandates will be the least of our problems, right? And what has gotten us to that point is not what's happened over the last 18 months as though it emerged ex nihilo or out of nothing or out of a vacuum, right? But my belief is that we have been putting in place the ideological, the sort of um, the social virtues, the political um, uh, devices in place in our society for many decades that have gotten to the, us to this point, right? And I've spoken about this in other interviews, but one of those is this collectivist idea. And I think a lot of people will say, well, collectivism sounds pretty good because it sounds like we're in it together and we're working for our, you know, our brothers and sisters and we're helping each other out. Um, well, that's altruism, right? That's thinking about and caring for other people. But there's a difference between altruism and collectivism. And the problem with collectivism is that it requires the sacrifice, requires, 
right? The sacrifice of individuals for the sake of a group. And that ideology, that moral sort of concept, if you will, I think has been developing slowly in our culture in various ways, in politics, but politics is really just a reflection of what's going on in society more generally. And I think the media has led to this. I think probably our influencing society, the society of influencers has led to this, this idea that we put value in people when they have a certain kind of reputation. Um, anyway, I think it's, it, this, is, this has been a slow burn and a slow growth, and we are seeing the apex of this now. And if we suffer because of this now, honestly, it's our own fault. I, I know you've published this uh, book, My Choice, which uh, you must be commended for writing so quickly, because in the grand scheme of things, this hasn't been a, a significant uh, period of time that, that you've had to work on this. Is your goal that you would be able to go back into the classroom at some point that we will all just wake up and realize that this was just a terrible mistake in society or, or is your view if we tap into that pessimism you've explained you you possess and I think rightfully so that that academia is kind of lost now and that any change you want to affect will have to take place outside of the academy. I, I have no, I have no, I think that's well put, Andrew. Academia, mainstream academia is in my view lost. It's a sunken ship. Um, we are very fortunate, I think, in seeing a number of different um, novel, maybe I'd call them institutions developing. There's one in Austin right now. Uh, and a number of, you know, a number of uh, instructors like myself or former, or maybe they're still employed at universities, and, you know, for various reasons, uh, but who are disillusioned with the state of academia and the state of censorship in, in academic thinking uh, are, are very interested in developing new ways for students to learn. And students who are actually interested, not just in getting a degree from an institution that's really a corporation, but who actually want to learn, um, have an understanding of history and where we came from as a human species and what all of the different options and ethics are and what it means to become a free thinker, what it means to become a democratic citizen. I mean, these are the things I thought our universities were trying to teach. These are the things I tried to teach. Um, I was punished for it. That's okay. You know, I, I don't want people to feel sorry for me because what that did for me, and I hope for many other people, was to provide a litmus test to see where we're at in academia, right? Um, I had a number of students from Western reach out to me yesterday who I didn't even know existed prior to yesterday, but they said that they have been trying to engage their professors with, with these kinds of questions that I've been asking uh, for weeks now, bordering on, I guess, a couple months, um, mm -hmm. and they're not getting anywhere. People just, they, they give them side glances, they, um, they dismiss them, there's no kind of engagement. So, you know, again, my concern is not that they or I or we convince other people of our particular belief, but what we do convince them of is the importance of having open dialogue about these issues. And so my, I, I, to be honest with you, Andrew, I will never work in, in academia again. I don't have a desire to work in it in the, in the way that it currently exists. What I do think we need to do is to untether our most important ideas from the ivory towers that our institutions really are now uh, and to allow them to, I say this in the book, right? That we need to allow them to um, free float into society and come down. I, I don't even, I don't like that kind of hierarchical language, but you know, to, to come out of our universities and have these ideas in, in true salon style exchanged over coffee at the local coffee shop and between families at the dinner table. And um, we need people to feel like they can ask questions themselves, whoever they are, whatever their degrees are. Um, their opinions are just as valid as the opinions of our so-called experts or our, our health officials. Do you find that you are, and this is a dangerous question because I think people might not like the answer, but do you believe that you are part of a silent majority or do you believe that people like you and I that believe in, in personal freedom on these things are the minority now? That's a, such a hard question because whenever you're talking about belief, you are trying to guess at what's on the inside of somebody as opposed to just what they say or write, you know? And I think there's so much fear these days of social ostracization, so much fear of, you know, losing one's job or being cast outside of society or, or worse, you know, being fined or arrested mm -hmm. or penalized in some way. 
So it's really hard to get an assessment of where people are at in their thinking. Um, my guess is that yes, we're, we're in the minority, um, but that there are many more people who have questions about these mandates than are, than are willing to or feel free to ask them, right? And I, um, you know, in some sense, I can say whatever I want. I can ask whatever I want because I've suffered the worst. You know, people might not know this, but every day I get hate mail every day from all sources, through email, through Instagram, through Twitter. Um, society can't do any worse to me. So I don't, I'm not shackled by this fear of what could happen, right? And that in some sense is the best position to be in because I've, you know, I've sort of embraced the most fearful thing. And I want to say to people, and it's okay. It's not great. I'd rather live in a world in which, you know, <laughs> someone was always kind and respectful and always asked, you know, oh, let, let me hear more about that. You know, yeah. um, that's not the world in which we live in now. I don't, that's probably not the world in which we've ever lived. It's something for humans to aspire to, certainly. But um, we should not feel as though the fact that we never attain it means it's not worth aspiring to. I know of those critics, a lot of people have tried to paint you in that guilt by association uh, sense of, oh, how dare you appear with Ezra Levant or Charles McVitie or whatever. And I, I've never had much patience for that. And, and in your book, you established that you don't either, which I'm grateful for. But I, I do want to ask you about the political implications of this in your life, because I know that the fight against vaccine mandates has been one generally taken up. And I, I you, may, you may disagree with this, but my belief is that it's generally taken up by people on the political right. I know you've appeared with Ezra and you've also uh, engaged with Maxime Bernier and, and you've been kind of put into that box, if you will, by a lot of your critics. Is that a place you've ever imagined placing yourself? And I, I don't know what your political leanings are or were prior to, to your uh, explosion on the stage as it is, but is that an identity you've ever taken on? Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say that I am willing to support any politician or any political party that uh, respects individual choice. And, and I don't, and when I say that, you know, that doesn't mean that, um, I mean, individual choice has become a synonym for selfishness these days, right? If you defend individual choice, it means, oh, you're selfish and you don't care about other people. Uh, that's a false dichotomy. I mean, the people I know who are fighting for freedom and fighting for liberty in our country today are the kindest, most generous, um, most giving, thoughtful people I have ever met. I, you know, I say in the book that um, Ezra Levant is in in many ways uh, a lightning rod in in Canadian history. He he has been. He always will be. Um, Ezra is is one of the kindest, brightest, most thoughtful people I've ever met, and I'm very proud to be working for him and everybody at the Democracy Fund. Um, I I wholeheartedly supported Maxime Bernier when he. Uh, ran in our most recent election. You know, I've had people say horrendous things to me about him. Oh, I wouldn't want to live in a country run by Maxime Bernier. And I say, well, why not? Point, point me to the bit of his policy that concerns you. Again, I find him to be incredibly thoughtful. I've interviewed with him a couple of times now, and he always asks very good questions. They're never rhetorical questions. He's genuinely interested in uh, in, in what I think about things. I think he's a very comprehensive thinker. Um, on the topic of, you know, sort of political um, partisanship, though, it's been very interesting because when I've gone to events, sure, there are a number of very far right thinking people there, but also people who would identify themselves as being very far thinking on the left. Uh, at the last Whitby event I went to, a number of people came up to me at the end and said, you know, I used to vote liberal or I used to always vote the Green Party or, um, and now I don't anymore. And I think that that's a testament to the fact that political thinking is, is very often circular, right? So people on the far right and the far left, they, they have more in common than we might think. And one thing that, that they tend to care about deeply is the largest sphere for free personal action possible as long as it doesn't harm other people. And so I've had really interesting conversations with um, people who, who have and continue to vote for the Green Party. And, um, you know, it's, uh, and I'm willing to talk to anybody. And I think that we need in society to be more aware of the fact that um, when we talk to another person, they might have something to offer us. 
we should, I posted on Instagram today that our Tuesday goal should be to listen to someone in order to understand and not just wait to reply or wait to bounce on them. And I believe that really, you know. It's unfortunate though in your own life that you've not seen that. You talked about uh, former colleagues of yours that were very quick to throw in some snark on Twitter, people you've worked with in your uh, your other uh, job as, as an artist that, I don't know if it's a job, but your passion, I guess, as an artist that, that have also uh, kind of cut you off because of this. So people are unwilling increasingly to engage in discussions with people they disagree with. Totally true, Andrew. But you know what, the one thing I've learned from, you know, re reading about and teaching ethics, and I think just reflecting in my own life is that you, I mean, we say this as though it's a cliche, but you can't control what other people do. And the lowering of their behavior should never act as justification for you to lower yours. You know, um, I, the, the hateful comments that I get on Twitter, and I, I never respond to, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's because I'm not interested in engaging with or having a debate with anyone who isn't interested in respectful exchange of ideas. Um, I have also made a commitment to, uh, when this book came out, I will not do an interview with any of the mainstream media uh, outlets because of the way I was treated in September when my video came out. The reporting by those outlets um, ranged from disrespectful to um, d uh, untrue. And there would be have to be a very unique set of circumstances for me to enter into that relationship again. You know, uh, And so we think we need to realize that as individuals, as moral agents, that all we can control is what we do. And I'm not going to start hurling hate out into the world and responding in kind just because that's what I, I'm getting. And anybody who's listening who is has, has done that to me and wants to do it again, I can take an unlimited amount of that. So do your best. And I will always respond as well as I can. I'm not going to be perfect at it. Some days I'm going to be more tired and more worn down than others, but I will never enter that arena with you. Very well said, and we're glad you have uh, been able to uh, come on this show here. The book by Professor Julie Panessi. You're still professor to me. My choice, The Ethical Case Against COVID-19 Vaccine Mandates. Uh, professor, thank you so much. Uh, congrats on the book, and, and thank you for joining me. Thank you, Andrew. That was Professor Julie Panessi. The book is something you can get at mychoicebook.ca, mychoicebook.ca. It's not a, a terribly long book. I think like 120 some odd pages, part memoir, part manifesto, but a lot of great material in there that you can use, not just to learn about uh, vaccine mandates and about uh, Professor Panessi, but also uh, details you can arm yourself with if you are going to take on the uphill battle, but the important battle of resisting these mandates in your own life, even just in, in private conversations. So, uh, and still time to get it for Christmas, I believe, uh, they say on the website there, mychoicebook.ca. That does it for me. We will be back in a couple days' time with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. Thank you, God bless, and good day. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.